great pleasure to be here. I have only been in New Mexico for five seconds in my life prior to this trip, up at Four Corners when I was 12 years old and put my foot down and was in New Mexico for five seconds. I've always regretted that and uh, not putting my foot down, but then I'm spending time here, so it's uh, really been enjoying my trip. And I can tell you, you have a pretty unusual um, set of beekeepers here. Just the way you keep bees and the way you look at things is quite different. And it's refreshing to me to see um, people that aren't maybe so quick to jump onto the uh, pesticide bandwagon that the rest of the industry has jumped on. So you should treasure that. It's a, it's a unique aspect of what you do. I am going to talk to you a bit today about how artists use bees. And um, tomorrow I'll be, talk I'll be talking and reading more from my book, uh, Bee Time. Uh, people are so interested in bees these days. Uh, bee Time, Lessons from the Hive, in Canada, for the last four weeks, it's been the number one best-selling non-fiction book in the country. Yeah. I'd like to, I think it's a good book, but it also reflects um, just an incredible interest that people have in bees. And that interest is not only um, expressed through caring about bees, but it's expressed quite deeply by artists who have used bees in all kinds of ways to express things about the, um, our human condition. For me, bees have been a muse. They've been a way that I've connected to bigger issues of who we are in the world and what we want to be, and I think the same thing is true for artists. Uh, it's not new. People have been using bees for uh, tens and tens of thousands of years to express themselves artistically and personally. Uh, there are cave paintings that go back 20 or 30,000 years that show people using bees by some of the very first artists. So it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, I think we've been impressed particularly by the bees' intense communication and the spiritual connection with nature that bees provide for us. What I'm gonna do today in the next 20 or 30 minutes is read a little bit from Bee Time and then I'm going to describe uh, four artists and how they've used bees in various ways for inspiration and collaboration. And when I'm done talking today, uh, you're going to write some poetry. I'll give you, give you a little bit of advance warning. It won't be as scary as you think. It's going to be fun. But you'll get a chance to express yourselves artistically and poetically, as well as hearing about some of the others in the, uh, in the community who have expressed themselves using bees. Tomorrow, by the way, uh, there are books for our bee time for sale, and I'll be signing books at lunchtime tomorrow if anybody um, would like a, a signed copy. So communication, spiritual connection. I think these are the two most fundamental things that artists have taken out of the beekeeping world. What's really remarkable about honeybees is how well they listen to each other. Uh, we as humans are not particularly good at listening, uh, but bees are constantly listening, taking up signals, not judging, just communicating, finding out what's going on in the hive, uh, learning the messages about what's coming back from the field, about the nectar and the pollen and the weather, and all the things that, make, make, uh, make, that are significant for bee colonies. And I want to read you a little section uh, from Bee Time about this remarkable ways that bees communicate. If there is a single element that stands out to explain why bees work together so well and from which we can learn some valuable lessons, it's their intense communication with each other. Honeybees excel at exchanging information with and maintaining a continual awareness of the hive mates around them an area where we humans could do considerably better. Bees listen to each other, deeply, all channels on, using every mode of communicating we know, and probably some we're not yet aware of. Vision, odor, taste, hearing, touch, vibration, magnetism, electric fields, the input is constant and the interaction is intense. Honeybees also appear endlessly curious, hungry for information, Soliciting news from each nestmate they encounter, 
and in turn, passing knowledge back. These exchanges can be seen in a flurry of activity, be stroking, stroking each other with antennae and legs, mouth parts exchanging food and pheromones. The curiosity and listening skills of honeybee workers stand as beacons to those of us who aspire to being more fully present to the world around us. Honeybees live very much in the moment, and their example reminds us that attentiveness is a key tool for successful teamwork. Honeybees have achieved what many of us strive for, a life lived in the moment, replete with deep, substantive interactions, enriched by relationships with others, and a profound connection with the environment around us. Artists have drawn on the communication capacity of bees to help themselves be fully present. But there's also a spiritual connection that we have with bees. Uh, I doubt there's anybody in this room who has not gone out to their apiary at one point and felt a deep spiritual connection to the bees and to the nature around them. You know, sometimes you're working hard and you're busy and you're concentrating on doing some management thing. But then all of a sudden you stop and there's that moment when you just absorb the feeling of the bees. And that sense of spirituality is something that's not present very often in most of our lives. But it is the core from which artists draw their inspiration. Bees remind us that but to some extent we've lost touch with our own spirituality. And they can also help us understand the really deep reasons why we should be a species more in balance with the world around us. It's another little bit from bee time. Perhaps our response to bees says more about the human mind's ability to imagine, to create story, and to devise metaphor through other species than it does about bees themselves. We have lost some of our confidence in listening to nature as modern life has come to rely more on data than myth. One value of honeybees to us is that they serve as a vehicle to explore the most unanswerable questions, whether we prefer fact or spirit as our guide. What is that something about bees that attracts us to them as a chaperone to the deep mysteries? Every behavior of bees can be explained as a simple response to their environment and each other, yet, when put together into a complex colony, we imagine a deeper meaning that any of the behaviors might inspire alone. That's why bees stimulate contemplation. What emerges for us from the totality of a bee colony is a guide with which to ponder what can't be proven. As we view their world, we use that vista as a starting point to consider our own. And that's what artists have done. They've used bees to stimulate contemplation as a lens through which we are both seen and reflected. Here's an artist, Agonitha Dick. Agonitha is a famous Canadian artist. She puts objects in beehives and lets the bees work around them, build comb. Of course, being Canadian, she's put hockey skates and other hockey material in the beehive. <coughs> But her art involves placing everyday objects into hives, and she encourages the bees to build comb around them. Agonitha was 38, homemaker with three young children, and like many uh, women in that situation, she had a growing need to get out of the house. So she started volunteering at the local art center, and she turned to what she knew best, being a mother of three young children, laundry. Agonitha began washing woolen garments over and over again until they shrank and became tiny sculptures that would stand alone when placed on the floor. But it was a chance encounter with a beekeeper 25 years ago that led her to combine her artistic interest in common household items with an instant fascination with the bees. This is her most famous piece, the wedding dress. It's a wedding dress that she put in a giant plexiglass cage with bees and honey. And the bees built this comb around the dress and around some of the other, the shoes and, and the purse and so on. It's a very famous piece in Canada. It's in our National Gallery. And Agonitha describes her first visit to an apiary. My first visit to an apiary was like entering another world, a foreign land. 
When the beekeeper opened the lid of a beehive for me, all my senses were awakened. I became totally alive, filled with imagination. Under the hive lid is a place filled with movement, scent, warmth, sound, and ambrosia. Working with honeybees has invigorated my ability to imagine. Being with the bees makes my ordinary life stand still and makes time disappear. Opening a hive for the first time is similar to tra traveling to a strange new country. The sights and scenes, the sound and warmth, the movement, these are rare discoveries. Agonetha sees the, views, sees the bees as her collaborators. It's not that she talks to the bees and says, build comb here, do this, but she puts objects in the hives and lets the bees decide how to collaborate with her. And it's not surprising that she uses the uh, comb building as her bridge to understanding the bees. Comb building is one of the most complex aspects of honeybees, and it's one in which they are particularly collaborative. You get small groups of bees working on single cells. It's business where a bee, an individual bee, has considerable importance and agency, and yet without the group of bees, the colony could never create comb. It is collaboration, it is the essence of collaboration. Here you see some of the wax flakes produced by single bees, and yet molded together by groups of bees that make the exact cell size and dimensions that create comb. It is no wonder that Agonitha saw bees as collaborative through comb building, because comb building is the ultimate collaborative enterprise. And it defines what collaboration is about. Collaboration is not about losing yourself. It's about you as an individual having agency to do something towards a bigger purpose. And that's what comb building is about. And that's what Agonitha saw in the bees. She also said, I began working with honeybees because they're sculptors, because they're the best architects anywhere. They're really the artists. When I put an object into the hive, the honeybees follow the object's contours, close openings, open closures. They create straight lines of comb where I would never have thought possible or necessary. Honeybees have and continue to inspire designers, architects and artists. They inspired me to collaborate with them because they feed my curiosity. They allow me to experiment, teaching me to think into their box and out of my box. The bees are my muse because they allow me to contemplate, to wonder and reflect on who is this truly mysterious, magical, gift-giving pollinator. Poetry is another art form for which bees have been sublimely important. I'm involved with an artist, with a poet, Renee Saklikar, who I will tell you about in a few minutes. But we're doing a project called Honey, Hives, and Poetry in the City, where we read uh, some of our own work, some work I've done, some work Renee has done, some work we've done together. And then we ask our audience, as I will ask you a bit later, to write their own poetry, to actively explore through language what bees mean to them. To them. This is not new. Some of the earliest poets, like Virgil, uh, wrote entire books of poetry about bees. Virgil was an interesting uh, guy. He provided a lot of practical advice in his poems, as well as being more lyrical about bees and nature. For example, here's what he had to say about locating hives. First, look for a site and position for your apiary, where no wind can enter, since the winds prevent them carrying home their food, and where no sheep or budding kids leap about among the flowers, or wandering cattle brush the dew from the field and wear away the growing grass. But let there be clear springs nearby, and pools green with moss, and a little stream sliding through the grass, and let a palm tree or a large wild olive shade the entrance. Take away the poetry, put that in you know, bullet points of where you should locate an apiary. It's exactly what you'll find in pretty much every uh, beekeeping guidebook you'll see. Virgil was way, way, way ahead of his time. He suggests some natural treatments for diseased colonies that perhaps today's pesticide and antibiotic intensive beekeepers might learn from. Here's what Virgil said. 
I'd urge you to burn fragrant resin right away. And give them honey through reed pipes, freely calling them and exhorting the weary insects to eat their familiar food. It's good, too, to blend a taste of pounded oak apples with dry rose petals, or rich new wine boiled down over a strong flame, or dried grapes from Scythian vines with attic thyme and strong smelling century. Today, of course, thyme is one of the ingredients in many organic beekeeping treatments. Probably the most famous poem about bees, William Butler Yeats, his famous Bee Loud Glade. I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee, and live alone in the Bee Loud Glade. I'm sure that every one of you has been to a Bee Loud Glade. Maybe in Me New Mexico it's not quite that green, but it's that place where you, you yearn to be when you're seeking the peace that the apiary can find for you. By the way, one of the most beautiful Bee Loud Glades I've ever seen was in this old movie with Peter Fonda, uh, Uli's Gold. How many of you have seen that movie? Yeah, do you remember those scenes where the old bee truck would go down the dirt road, you know, trees everywhere, and pull into the apiary, the beautiful apiary locations they had? That, that alone was poetry. I saw that movie actually at the opening. Uh, the beekeepers in our community were given a bunch of free tickets. And uh, we went, loved the movie, but you know, the, the theater like, like this one was full of beekeepers. And there came, there was this one point in the movie where Uli is building frames. You know, he's taking the frames and banging them together. And an argument broke out with the beekeepers in the row in front of me. But whether he was using the right size nails or not. <laughs> it's a pretty typical beekeeping beekeep crowd. Sylvia Plath, uh, another well-known poet, uh, was also deeply involved in bees. She and her husband had taken up beekeeping, and she actually wrote a beekeeping series of beekeeping poems. Here's a little bit of one about winter. This is the time of hanging on for the bees. Will the hive survive? Will the gladiolas succeed in banking their fires to enter another year? What will they taste of the Christmas roses? The bees are flying. They taste the spring. This was a deeply personal and deeply tragic poem. And it turned out to be overly optimistic because Sylvia Plath committed suicide just a few months later. And ironically, she was living in the same house that William Butler Yeats of Be Loud Glade had lived in many years before. This is my uh, colleague, Renee Saklikar, with whom I'm collaborating on a uh, Bees and Poetry project. I just wanted to read you a little bit about what Renee says about bees and poetry. Uh, by the way, Renee uh, is a bee poem collector. And I hadn't known this before I met her. She's collected, I think when we chatted, she had collected 897 different poems that had bees in them. Here's what she says about uh, the attraction of bees for her poetry. It's about humming. It's about industry. It's about sex, it's about death, it's about dance, it's about the names. I love the feel of bee words in my mouth. It's also linked to my awareness of poetry as making. Bees are about making things, this creation aspect, storing, gathering. Bees are our familiars. also been involved in some dance projects with the Link Dance Foundation in, um, in Vancouver and then we've taken some of these projects across Canada. This is from a piece called Symbiosis about the dependency of everything on each other. Uh, this particular moment that you see choreographed here became a key moment in the piece. During rehearsals, Gail would always tell us if we felt like doing something on the stage, just do it. And maybe we'll include it in the dance. And there was this one point towards the end of the dance where these two dancers, beautiful dancers, were over there dancing. And I was the scientist and I was over here commenting about their dance and about 
symbiosis. And I just felt incredibly lonely. And I walked over to the dancers and I intertwined with them. And that became a key moment in the piece. Then, um, I never appeared in a dance before. And um, I'm a pretty good Western swing dancer. But this kind of modern dance was really not my thing. And um, I had no idea, we had no idea at all how people would respond. Uh, we were in a, a theater like this on an opening night, but the way it was lit, we couldn't see the audience. We didn't even know if there was anybody out there. Um, so we did the dance, it was about 30 minutes. And at the end of the dance, we all came up to the front of the stage to take a bow, and the lights came up. It was one of those rare and stunning moments in, in theater when nobody clapped. There were people in the audience, many people, with tears streaming down their face because they had been so impacted by this performance. And it helped me realize that it doesn't matter how many facts and figures we throw at people. People respond to stories, they respond with emotion. And if we want to sell the idea that bees are important, yes, it's important to give people the information and the facts, but that's not going to do it. We need to work with the arts in order to create the kind of impact that really resonates with people. And that's what I learned from this uh, first set of, first dance we did, Symbiosis. Here's something that um, Gail said about bees. Bees have such a well-known frequency or rhythm connected to them and their movements and their sonic trademark. I was entranced by the invitation to ramp up to their frequency. But then there is the beautiful contradiction that to be safe around bees, you have to actually move towards stillness. This contradiction is rich territory for imagination and inspiration. I really love that line, you have to move towards stillness. Those of us who hardly ever get stung are the ones in the apiary who are calm. And as you know, when you bring someone in the apiary who's flailing around, you know, they're the ones that are going to attract all the stinging. If there is a spiritual aspect to bees, then it is in their beeness. As a result of creating with bee imagery, I have developed connection and community, as well as artistic purpose and gratitude. They are a constant source of wonder and kindling for the imagination. I want to finish the talking part of this uh, experience with uh, just another short piece from Bee Time. No matter how extensively we have modified our world for many purposes, we still crave a bond with nature and with each other. We may harm our environment through careless development, but we also strive to save and protect the other species with which we share an increasingly fragile planet. Bees act as connectors to acquaint us with our neighbors and stimulate deep collaborations and friendships. Their sociality and the complex environmental webs bees inhabit provide a muse that guides us in reflecting on who we are and want to be with each other and with the world. That's why bee time is so compelling. As we come to bees, we see an echo of ourselves. Thank you.